What a crazy weekend, but none crazier than the cheetah. Tyreek Hill on his way to the game, driving his Lamborghini. Sweet as you please. Apparently, he had a suspended license. Apparently, well, he had no driver's license. What? Cops pulled him over. Somehow, something escalated. He ended up face down, unbelievably face down, with a cop's knee in his back. There you see him. You kind of get blocked a little bit there, but he's got a cop's knee in his back. He's face down, and he's cuffed. Now, I asked a couple people, prosecutor one, former prosecutor, and a defense attorney, and they said, look, if you're driving without a license, with a suspended license, no license, no valid nothing, well, sometimes you do get cuffed, but... Hard to fathom unless, and this is the caveat to it, unless words were exchanged and the cops felt themselves to be in some type of disrespectful danger. That's how that escalated. Now, subsequent to this, a cop, a police officer, has been suspended or at least put on administrative leave pending an investigation. Clayus Campbell and another teammate came over. Campbell got himself put in cuffs as well. Wild. Wild, wild, wild scene, uh, lottery action, as you can only imagine. You know how this goes, baby. Stephen A. Smith had to chime in how things escalated in half cu- in handcuffs being held on the ground with police is mind-boggling to me. This is Drew Rosenhaus, excuse me. The most important thing is that Tyreek is okay physically, mentally. He was very distraught over what happened. Tyreek has told me over and over again, big supporter of police. He was telling police, I want to be a police officer in the future, but this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. You know, a lot of people haven't either. I wasn't there and I don't purport to be there, but I did ask people. And again, kind of rare that you get handcuffed, put on your stomach, hands behind your back with a knee in your back and go ahead and try it. Maybe without the cuffs, unless, you know, You and mama want to get dirty. But anyway, uh, if you lay in that position, boy, is that uncomfortable. On a road, in a T-shirt. Oh, man, that's crazy uncomfortable. I don't know what Tyreek Hill did, if anything, to get put in that position. But I have a hard time believing nothing was done, nothing was said. Or if it did, if that's the way it went, cops got a serious problem. Stephen A. Smith chimes in this story with the police involving Tyreek Hill. Ain't going away, damn it. Traffic violation, fine. But what the hell? Was he face down in cuffs, stood up, and then the officer ran over behind him, forced him to the ground again? Hell no. Excessive. Wrong. Again, this ain't going away. Yeah, it is not going away. Uh, Stephen A. Smith is 100%. This is not going away. Remember the Scotty Scheffler case? Cop got suspended, if not fired. Another cop ended up getting arrested because he was dirty cop. There's no chance this is going away anytime soon, not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. Smith also had this to say, look, look for yourself. This BS is totally unnecessary. And by the way, I know the Scotty Scheffler incident was in Georgia, not Florida. Well, it was in Louis, uh, Louisville. And he was arrested, detained, booked. I also know we don't know all the details, blah, 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 blah. But he wasn't face down on the ground in cuffs, true. And forcibly sat down again by officers a second time. Nah! This story ain't going away, and it doesn't need to. He's right. No, he's right. I mean, look, I am always pro-cop until things like this happen, and then I got to ask, well, is this normal procedure? Now, maybe it is in Miami-Dade County. You know, every county's different. Every state's different. Maybe it is. Maybe if you're driving without a license, and maybe something was said that forces them to not only cuff you, but, but puts you on the ground. When I was in Indiana in 08, we had a big fat player. Name was Big Fat DeAndre Thomas. Got busted driving with a suspended license. Didn't have one. They took him to jail. Had to go bail his fat ass out. I personally didn't want to. I thought jail would be the best thing for him. Not for a long time, but for a night just to see. And it was actually. It straightened him out. He came out of jail. Big six foot eight, 325 pounds of blubber. And he was shook up. Monroe County Jail or any jail is no place to be. So I understand that there are procedures in different places. Obviously, Hill didn't go to jail. Guy in Bloomington, Indiana did. But the facts are these. 
The facts are he did get a moving violation. It is a serious enough violation that many times people are put in cuffs, but I don't know. This is where it's not fact. I have no idea why he was put on the ground with a knee in the back. That is what's going to have to be answered to. That's what's going to have to be answered for, excuse me. And you know what's going to happen. I mean, there's going to be an uproar over this, and maybe rightfully so, maybe not. I don't know. But, but, make no mistake, there's already an internal investigation going on. There's already one cop put on paid leave. Now, I don't necessarily know, yes, no, maybe, whether or not in the post game. Tyreek Hill was serious about wanting to be a cop, was serious about turning a positive out of this. But I do know this, in the post-game interview, he handled it very, very well, very well. So, we'll see moving forward. But Scotty Scheffler did get arrested. Scotty Scheffler did get booked. Again, I go back to something. See, I have a tendency to ask questions and be sensible about these things. But I am also... Not a guy that's, well, yes, I have been cuffed twice. So I get it, I guess. But the fact of the matter is this. Every state, every city, every district, every county has different rules for different things, different reactions to different things. Now, fast forward, Tyreek Hill, and I was kind of digging this, Tyreek Hill went 80 yards for a touchdown in the game against Jacksonville. And then he did a handcuff thing behind his back. Not going to lie. I kind of dug it. I did. I did. I know we're not supposed to. I know we're supposed to be reverent. I know we're supposed to do all that kind of stuff. But I dug it. What can I tell you? I like things like that. We'll see where this goes. Let me see a little Scotty Scheffler, Tyreek Hill meme in that. There you go. Now you, you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. I don't even know what that means. But I like it. And in fact, that's Mark Harris, our golf guy extraordinaire here at Outkick. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. We'll see where this goes. But anyway, hey, good for the Miami Dolphins. 336 yards, I believe it was by 280 the hill. And the Dolphins, I told you that heat's nasty. I know the Jacksonville Jags are used to that heat, but I was told by an NFL GM, ain't nobody used to that heat for an hour. 60-minute game, three hours. Nobody. And guess what happened? Jumped out early, Jacksonville did. Uh Uh-huh. Next thing you know, 52-yard field goal. Jacksonville didn't score for a long, long time, and the Miami Dolphins got her done. September games in Miami, according to folks inside the NFL, as a visiting team, are a mother. They put you on this side. The heat's pounding on you all game. It's hard. Really hard. Miami got her done. There you go. Uh, Really odd, but not unexpected. More drama out of America's drama queen. And that's a good thing for her, Angel Reese. Angel Reese, out of the blue, she was looking at her wrist during the game, and then next thing you know, I'm done for the year. Damn done. I got a season-ending knee, uh, ankle, knee. How about wrist? Jeez, wrist. Yeah, she's not going to play for the rest of the year. She also claimed no one believed in her. No one believed in her. Oh, really? All right, we'll get to that in a minute. During her college career and into her first season. Through it all, Angel Reese said, I've shown that I belong in this league even though no one else believed. Really? Oh, yeah, I don't want to read all that other crap. All I have ever wanted was to come into the W and make an impact. I can confidently say I've done that and will strive to keep doing so. All right, baby, you go, girl. You go. Michelle Tafoya, our friend, had a, well, somewhat factual reaction. What? No one else believed. Seventh overall pick, national champ, NCAA tourney MVP, unanimous first team at All-America, 2023. No one else believed. Vogue believed. Sky believed. I'm struggling to understand what you mean by no one else believed. Well, she's doing what you do. See, it's like athletes go to some kind of conference. And at that conference, they tell people how to go about the business of victimhood. No one believed in me. Really? You're seventh pick of the draft. What are you talking about? No one believed in you is Brock Purdy. No one believed in you is Tony Romo. Like, what are you talking about? No one believed in you 
I mean, damn. Seemed like everybody believed in you. Seemed like everybody knew who you were. What, are you supposed to be the first pick? Is the first pick the only one that no one believed in? Are we going to hear Caitlin Clark come out and say, no one believed in me? I was the first pick in the draft, but nobody believed. I swear to you, they didn't. Look around. Hey, athletes, stop being the victim. See, what we need out of athletes is athletes to be leaders. Athletes, like politicians, have fallen into a bad role. A victimhood. We got enough victims. We got enough people acting victims. Hell, dogs and cats in Springfield, Illinois, are victims of Haitians, illegal immigrants, eating them. That's victims. Ducks are disappearing. Heads are being chopped off. Ducks, cats, whatever. Those are victims. You being the seventh pick in the draft, and oh, I don't know, being a national champ, MVP of the NCAA tournament, six foot three? Huh. Maybe you hang out with the wrong people. Maybe the people that you hang out don't believe in you. But it seems to me the WNBA believed in you. It seems to me ESPN, N, 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 up until the time when it became obvious that the only reason anybody would have put you in a category of Caitlin Clark is because you're black, she's white, we need a villain, we get it. But as my good friend used to say, stop it, stupid. Uh, this is kind of weird. Sometimes we splat. See, everybody always thinks we always get the better deal. We all, if we advocate for ourselves or hold out or talk, we're going to get a better deal. Brandon Ayuk found out that's not true. It's kind of interesting, kind of funny. Ayuk was about to be traded to the Steelers, but he chose to stay with the 49ers. Ayuk didn't want to go to Pittsburgh. Ayuk, like Brittany Griner in Russia, see, I'm making a weird comparison there, but it was the first thing that popped in my head. Learn that home is a lot better than he or she thought it was. Remember Griner went to the can in Russia, the gulag or whatever the hell you call it. She came back, and next thing you know, the Adams Ampled One is singing the national anthem proudly and loudly after a little stretch somewhere else. Well, This is a stupid comparison, but hey, look, I'm pot committed. Ayuk looked around, said, where can I go? How about Pittsburgh? Wait a second. It's cold in Pittsburgh. Hang on, caller. I don't think we're going to win the Super Bowl in Pittsburgh. Who the hell is a quarterback? 172 years old and fraud Russell Wilson? Or the guy that can't hit a broad side of the barn but can run like hell Justin Fields? Wait a second. Maybe I'll just stay and stay dead. Stayed right here. Stayed with his original team at the 11th hour. Jay Glazer, who I guess is an expert on football, even though he told me Frank Reich was a, quote, quote, elite coach, apparently had this to say. Or a uke did. I can't remember. I'm either not hearing anything or I screwed something up. If you guys hear that, what's that? Little little audio problem? All right, I didn't hear that, but that's okay. We'll try again. We'll try again later. We'll try again to hear from Brendan and I. You, I got to tell you, I would not mind going to Pittsburgh. It's a storied out organization with a great coach and a great infrastructure. But I also got to tell you, it feels like to me, feels like, The San Francisco 49ers got a damn good squad. We'll find out tonight as they take on Aaron Rodgers, but it feels like they got a damn good squad. In fact, I had an NFL guy tell me that, man, oh, man, they got about two of everything. So maybe Ayuk made the right decision. I don't know. Hey, Shadur Sanders got his ass kicked, left the game with two minutes to go in the game. Now, I'm going to give you something that my wife even disagreed with. When we talked about Shadur Sanders leaving the Colorado-Nebraska game early, she's like, yeah, kind of a punk move. I said, you know what? Probably a good move. Why? Well, because if, if, and probably I don't think they ended up doing it. It's not worth it. But if the fans rush the field, then Sanders could have a serious problem. You know, he's, he's always doing that stupid stuff and, 
holding onto his wristwatch, and Daddy's wearing the gold headphones and all the gold, you know, all that kind of. They're kind of egging a crowd out, right? And when you get your ass beat, well, there's an intensity to the victors that isn't normal. Like, let's put it this way. I'm watching the Colorado game against Nebraska, and I told Lee, I go, man, I don't think it's going to be the same intensity if Indiana comes in there or Illinois. Maybe. And so Sanders leaves with a couple minutes to go after playing horrifically, getting his ass kicked. His teammate, Travis Hunter, who everybody tells me is the best player in college football, maybe he is, showed his ass. I mean, he's yelling. He's acting like a petulant child. Deion Sanders on the sideline didn't know when to call timeout, didn't know when to do what. But I will say this. I kind of agreed with Deion Sanders. After the game, Sanders felt like his team got better in the second half, and I agree. Now, Sanders told us, y'all better get me now, meaning last year. Well, okay, I guess. But I will say this. Sanders' team, which looked disorganized, dysfunctional, and ridiculous in the first half, settled in, outscored Nebraska 10-zip in the second half, and I thought the defense stood on its head. I thought it was pretty good. So Sanders got that going for him, which is nice. Let's hear from Shador Sanders throwing his teammates under the bus because, well, he seemingly is an entitled little kid playing for daddy, no different than the 12-year-old in Little League. Let's hear from Shador. I mean, how many times did Riley get touched? Yeah, what? How many times did Riley get touched? There was able, like, of course, of course, whenever you're able to run the ball consistently and whenever you're able to, then that opens up the pass, you know? But it's just like you got to understand, like, what, what what your team good at. So it's like, why would we keep running the ball if, okay, we are we out there and we get in a situation where it's a must get and we don't get it? Right. Are those, so, like, kind of like fourth and one? Conversions that haven't gone to you guys late in the last couple is that kind of play into everybody's mind? Is that kind of something on your mind thinking about, you know, advancing the ball and whatnot? No, nah, I'd rather, if, if we're going to go down, I'd rather go down swinging, honestly, because I know I could throw the best punch. Yeah, all right, good. Yeah, all right, good. I mean, you know, when you're four and nine, I mean, say whatever you'd like. What difference does it make? You know, I mean, I, whatever you want to say, I can throw the best punch. How many times did he get touched? My, all right, fine. But I will say this. The team got better. And look, I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, I like Coach Prime. I like what he's doing with the media. I like how he's handling those punks. I like how he's stepping up. Is uh, Shador Sanders the most accountable guy? No. Why? Well, he plays for his daddy. And his daddy's making excuses. That, all right. But from a team perspective, a lot of people counting Colorado out for the rest of the year. I don't know about that. Either Colorado got a lot better, and I know what you're going to say. Well, Nebraska took their uh, foot off the gas. What does that mean? Well, exactly. Then Nebraska's not a very good football team. Or Nebraska's not a very tough football team. Or Nebraska doesn't know what the hell's going on in college football because taking your foot off the gas, particularly against a high-profile team, ain't the business you're in. I didn't feel like they took the foot off the gas. I felt like Colorado settled in. So remember this moment, whatever day this is. What the hell day is this? What what day are we talking about here? What is this, the 9th? September 9th, 920. I'm telling you, Colorado ain't dead. Now, we can come back and play this in four or five weeks if Colorado's on like a five or six game losing streak. And I'll eat it. I'll sit in it, as Matt Painter said, about losing in the first round. The St. Peter's or whatever, the Fairleigh Dickinson or whomever. I'll sit in it. But I got to tell you, I watched second half of that game, and despite the fact that it was the worst broadcast I have ever seen in my adult life on a major network. And by the way, memo to Colt McCoy, study. Get some inflection in your voice. And wait a second, that halftime show with that Nicole Arbaugh and Josh Perra, it was the perfect DEI set. They had a black woman, a black man, a white woman, and a white man. All we needed was Mina Kimes, and we'd have had the perfect set. But damn, that was the worst broadcast, and I never thought I'd say this. I never, ever thought that I would see a worse pre-half and post-game show than the Amazon Prime one with that big fat guy Wentworth and the drunks and everybody else that they got on that set, Sherman and Lynch and... You know, the obligatory blonde girl, whatever the hell her name is, Clarissa Thompson, maybe. I don't know. I worked with Clarissa, nice girl. 
But anyway, long story short, that was, by the way, uh, Colt McCoy rivaling Tom Brady. Now, Colt McCoy is much worse than Tom Brady, but Brady's right there with him. That was awful. I'll get into that in a minute. But long story short, Sanders' team getting better. Don't even at me on it. Don't even think about adding me. Um, interesting stuff in quarterback play. And by the way, congrats to Gerard Mayo and a guy that I've told you I really like, Jacoby Brissett, on the win. The old curmudgeon coach, Belichick, knows a thing or two about quarterbacks, especially quarterbacks with a New England Patriot on the side of their helmet. See what Knicks are doing here? And he's not really high on Drake May. And former Patriot slash Cowboy, Drew Bledsoe, man, oh man, he took a swipe, a really big swipe at Tony Romo. Now this goes back years. I bet you Romo woke up and he didn't see, oh, I got to dodge shrapnel from Drew Bledsoe from my time 20 years ago in Dallas. Whoa. Got to wear Kevlar these days when you're on TV. Here's Belichick talking about Drake May. You like his size and you like his arm. I think his inexperience really, you know, showed up in the preseason, you know, as it did a little bit in North Carolina. And I think that he needs a lot of seasoning in terms of reading coverages, overall throw mechanics and consistency. Is he, you know, a big, fast athlete? Yeah, but I think it's going to take more than that to be ready to play quarterback in the National Football League. But you can't give away. You got an easy throw, you got to make it. No, I mean, you expect quarterbacks at this level to be able to throw check downs to backs, to throw, yeah. you know, slant routes to wide receivers, to hit a wide open seam. And... And look, you know, we all have plays that we wish we had back. Just saying these are some of the things that, you know, we need to work on. I think that May probably has has more of these than the other quarterbacks do, based, based on what we've seen in preseason, yeah. which is, a, you know, granted a limited sample. I like Drake May. Not really. Don't care about Drake May. Like his brother Luke, pretty clutch player at North Carolina basketball. You know, the old curmudgeon Belichick looked a little worse today. It's just my feeling. Gerard Mayo took over, former player. Next thing you know, they got a massive win, and they probably killed. Tell me the truth. Did it kill you in your elimination pull? Everybody was taking Cincinnati and Jolt and Joe Burrow. But I'm telling you, and I always warn of this, I always warn of guys like Joe Burrow who are always hurt, big early, right? Oh, man, big early. Now we're going to change our hair. Look at me. I'm going blonde. All right. Tom Brady changed his hair. You're going to tell me, yeah, but I don't think Joey Ballgame is Tom Burrow, but maybe, or Tom Brady, but maybe he is. Maybe he is. Maybe he is, and I don't know, but what I do know is this. They got the ass beat. They got the ass beat, and I like the Cincinnati Bengals. I've told you before, Teddy Karras, Jr., Jr., to all of us, son of the great coach at Marion University, Teddy Karras, Jr., is the center on that team and arguably the best human being in professional sports. They lost. I'm not happy about it. But I am happy for Jacoby Brissett. Never met Jacoby Brissett. Watched him with the Colts. Got a job with the Colts. He got a job. If Adam Vinatieri, uh, long past his prime last year, could have kicked two extra points and a field goal, they'd have been 7-0. and And Brissett might have cemented himself here. But long story short, he didn't, and we move along. But good for Gerard Mayo now. The other part of this relative to quarterbacks, all of a sudden, out of the blue, we're hearing from former Patriot, former Cowboy, Drew Bledsoe, who's talking about Tony Romo. My head just blew up. All of a sudden, what? What? Let's hear from Drew Bledsoe. In Dallas, Parcells made the decision to yank me at halftime of a game and throw Romo in there. Really didn't agree with that one. If you're watching this, Romo, uh, you know this is true. Uh, the minute that he became the starter, he became pretty big in his own mind. Uh, and he was no longer the curious, in- inquisitive guy. Where well, That was the difference between him and Tommy. Tommy became the starter. He still was asking all the questions where uh, all of a sudden Romo was the guy that had all the answers. Well, that's easy. You got to stay on Tommy's good side, um, but not necessarily – Romo's. Romo's an easy target these days, and Romo has made himself an easy target these days because he's gotten lazy in the boot. Romo was very interesting and fun early. He would tell us things that didn't or weren't. Let me back up. He would tell us things that were going to happen before they happened. And then all of a sudden, he got lazy, stupid, flippant. 
and I like listening to him. And if I don't like listening to you, pal, you got a problem because I am all things media. But anyway, long story short, I bet Romo didn't wake up this yesterday morning thinking, huh, Bledsoe's coming at me. I got a duck. Maybe he did know. You know, in the world of uh, high-priced former quarterbacks, I wonder if somebody got to Romo and said, yo, this is what's going to happen. I didn't get a chance to listen to Romo yesterday, and I didn't want to. I did get a chance to listen to Tom Brady, and I thought he was awful. And I'm going to give Tom Brady the benefit of the doubt. You know, reps are important when you do that job, and it feels like to me that Kevin Burkhardt, who's an excellent broadcaster, play-by-play man, no matter the sport, baseball, basketball, football, you name it, Kevin Burkhardt is really good. It felt like to me that Tom Brady hadn't really done not only his homework, but hadn't really practiced. Now, understand this, the NFL is a little different. When I started at ESPN, this is a true story. My first game, Indiana against Wright State. I literally at halftime told my partner, now Red Sox announcer Dave O'Brien, Bart Fox, our producer, and Scott Johnson, our director, I'm quitting at halftime. Go, I'm going home. I can't do this job. I'm awful at this job. I'm going to quit. And they're like, shut up. You're not, no, no, no. I'm done. I'm awful. My next gig, and this is what makes basketball far easier, was in Orlando for one of those, you know, Christmas or uh, Thanksgiving tournaments. Did about five or six games, two in a day, two in a day, then one. And by the end of it, I was really comfortable. Reps are important. Reps are important on this show. Reps are important on the radio. Reps are important on NFL Sundays, and you don't get it. No matter what anybody says, there's a hell of a difference between practicing in front of your mirror or practicing in a studio and going out, calling the Dallas Cowboys-Cleveland Browns game on the biggest game, knowing the entire country's watching you, and this is your first time. I don't give a damn if you're Tom Brady or Dan Dock. But Brady's voice is what gets me. Brady's voice, and I knew this was going to happen. I did, I swear. I knew Brady's voice was going to be a problem. It doesn't signify. It doesn't pierce. It doesn't penetrate. And I also knew that really there was nothing that he could give us. He gave no real insight. He didn't criticize Deshaun Watson, who, by the way, was as bad a quarterback as I've ever seen on as bad a contract as there has ever been in the NFL. Let's just be honest. He didn't criticize. By by all accounts, he's not allowed to be in production meetings because of some weird thing. He's going to be a part owner of the Las Vegas Raiders, and that makes him not eligible for some weird reason to sit in production meetings with, I don't know, coaches, general managers, assistant coaches of other teams. It's very weird. It's not that important in basketball. Basketball is fast-paced. In fact, if you do a radio broadcast in basketball, the color analyst is, one, unnecessary, two, told to get out by the time the ball's at half court. So you really need to talk to anybody. There's not that much, as they call it, room. Football, a lot of room. Play goes six seconds. You got another minute, and a minute's a long time on the air. So long story short, uh, this ain't going to get better for Brady either. Now, here's what's going to happen. Brady is either going to have guys like me that say he's no good and be honest, or he's going to have media members and others tell you how really good he is, how insightful he is. Why? He's Tom Brady. And they know that if you can get a relationship with Tom Brady, that means money in your pocket because the dude craps money. I personally don't care. I figure you watch this show so I can tell you what's what. And that's exactly what I'm doing. He was bad. Or let me put it a better way. It wasn't that he was bad. It's just that he's average. You're paying a guy $37 million a year to do what? 17 games, some promotional stuff. You got him in your stable. I don't know. I think he works for Fox, so maybe I should shut up because $37 million is a hell of a lot more than a buck ten. But I get it. You're asking me to do a show. I'm going to give you the honest. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, Speaking of honesty, let's talk about the NFL. My Colts and the Texans, look, 11 straight. Can you believe this? Nobody can believe this. 11 straight years, the Colts have lost opening day. 
One time they tied. 2013 is the last time the Colts won an opener against the Oakland Raiders, and Terrell Pryor was the quarterback. I want you to think about that action. 2013. So our current general manager is in year eight, Chris Ballard. Even though all NFL wonks will tell you what a great general manager he is, Chris Ballard has never won an opening day, is on his fifth head coach in eight years, his seventh started quarterback in eight years, no division titles in a very, very winnable division, no home playoff games, and in eight years has a playoff victory. Oh, no. That's what we get here in Indianapolis, so it was no surprise. And we've told you on this show, and I told you on my afternoon show, what was going to happen with Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson was going to make all the highlights. In fact, before this show started, I was watching ESPN. ESPN's number one play was a long bomb back foot by Anthony Richardson for a touchdown to Alec Pierce. All right, you're going to get a lot of that. Anthony Richardson completed nine passes, 47%. Now, the future seems bright because he had guys wide open. A.D. Mitchell, wide open, throw it even around him, and it's a touchdown. Michael Pittman Jr., wide open, throw it even near him, around him, it's a touchdown. But remember this, ladies and gentlemen, and this isn't just the Colts. This is any football team anywhere, anytime. Toughness matters. I've said forever, problem with the Colts, no toughness. So what happens? Over 200 yards rushing by the Texans. Texans end up beating the Colts. And once again, we are swimming upstream in the division. Sadness prevails. But hey, Anthony Richardson made some highlights. We knew that was coming. Uh, We talked about the Patriots and the Bengals, but... One of the things that I am always fascinated by is this. If you are a player's coach and you are replacing the mean old man, which is what Bill Belichick is, right? The mean old man. Okay. All right. The first game, the first game you play, players play their uh uh-uhs off. You saw it yesterday with your odd mail. You saw it. If you didn't see it, I cannot help you. They played their uh uh-uhs off. That's always the first game. Now, as I said, a lot of people play in elimination pools. I saw a a statistic that said as many as 70% of folks in elimination pools had the Bengals to beat the Patriots. What elimination pool is, you pick one game a week. And if you pick that team, in this case, if you pick the Bengals and they lose, you're out. You can only pick a team once. So there you go. No, man, it's fascinating. Uh, Jags and the Dolphins. The Jags look like world beaters. Oh, man, we're rolling 17 zip or whatever it was. Look at us. Next thing you know, I told you. And I know Jacksonville's in Florida, but it ain't like Miami, son. You put them in the sun, and this is always the test of teams. Can you play the entire time against a team, Miami, in Miami, in that sun, in September? October, November, you're good. First game out of the, out of the box, 8th of December, are you, or 8th of September. Are you kidding me? And that's what happened. Jacksonville wilted. Again, toughness. Colts have never had toughness. Never. Jacksonville didn't have enough. There you go. But by the way, yo, Nick, are you around? I got to tell you, late in the day. Late in the day, the text came in from my man Sackman. We had had a struggle in the first 1 o'clock period. We got really, really fat. In the 4 o'clock period, I think he hit every one, and then it came in. It came in. We're taking, listen to this, the Detroit Football Lions, given five, under 54 and a half. Woo! I didn't like it, but the sack man said it. I bet it. Next thing you know, I'm up. Big, seemed like. Fell asleep. Halftime, there was like 10 points scored. Maybe 13. I'm good. Uh Uh-oh. Wake up. 
found out I won. Always good to wake up and find out you won. But I didn't realize you went to overtime, which begs this question. Should both teams get the ball in overtime? Where the hell is my man Nick? My answer is no. Hell no. You got three sides of the football. You got offense, you got defense, and you got special teams. Hey, defense, how about you guard somebody? Why is offense considered more important than defense in football? Explain that one to me, Spanky. I don't get it. See, people say, well, both teams should have the football. What are you talking about? Don't you practice defensively? Don't you guard somebody in football? Isn't that, I don't know, let's take special teams out. Isn't that 50-50 of the proposition? Well, it's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? You let a team drive down and go get a touchdown? That's on you. Field goal, you get the ball. Hey, I kind of dig the rule. Why isn't defense important? I always hear defense wins championships. Defense doesn't win championships. What does defense do? But that's the raging debate as I knew it would be when I woke up this morning to do first Fox and Friends or Fox and Friends first. I don't know, but I killed it, knocked it out of the park. That's the first thing I woke up to. Well, not first thing was winning and winning big. I'll tell you, when we come back after break, I'll tell you the game I really won big on, but I digress. I can't find my man Nick. He's not around today. He must have gone out with his hat, his urban sombrero, and gotten his ass kicked. And now maybe he's all damaged up. But when we come back, we had a wild weekend in football. And I got to tell you, man, made a lot of money on one game. Maybe you did too. The great Bobby Valentine, longtime manager, media member, uh, fake mustache. I always wanted him to manage my Cubs. I grew up outside Chicago, Bobby, and I always always wanted you to manage my Cubs, but that – that pipe dream went away. All right, let's get into it. First, I got to ask, 9-11 hits. You're in New York. You're managing uh, the Mets. Piazza hits a home run. What was it like managing the New York Mets during those years or during that particular time, actually? Wow, well, that particular time was, uh, well, yeah, it's almost coming up, isn't it? Here's 9-11's coming up. Um you know, it was the, it was the uh, craziest time that uh, I I was ever part of anything. And to be part of New York City, to be part of New York Mets, be part of the recovery that uh, ensued was, um, uh, it, it was amazing. You know, we we waited 10 days, uh, came back on 921. Mike Piazza hit that home run. It was a shot heard around the world uh, for sure because – the sound of it was uh, so crackling. It was an amazing uh, barrel, if you will. That's what they call it these days. And, um, you know, it, it just turned the frowns upside down and, and got things going in the right direction again. How important was baseball? How important was getting back to normalcy, baseball being a huge deal all around the country, particularly in New York, uh, during those 10 days when you were off? Well, um, you know, the the president at the, at the time was George W. Bush. Of course, he was the uh, general managing general partner of the Texas Rangers when I managed them. And he was a great baseball fan. And he truly believed he was the one that believed that if baseball came back, uh, the road recovery would be a lot, uh, a lot better. And, and he pushed for it and I believed in him. And, um, I think the, the reason we played in New York, the reason the Atlanta Braves came to New York, the reason, um, Mike Piazza hit the home run in New York, uh, was mainly because George W, uh, felt that that was the right thing to do. You know, how, how, what, what what was the what were the ten days like? You know, between nine eleven and then nine twenty one. What what was it? It's li- tough. It's tough to even remember. You know, it was uh, uh, it, it was a whole new world. We were dealing with fear for the first time, and in, in, in real fear, fear of the unknown. You know that that most of us uh, had no idea uh, how to deal with. Um, you know, New York City was disheveled. Uh, uh, the the smoke uh, lasted ten days from from the the buildings. It was um, 
um, it, it was it was a whole new world. You know, when we came back, there were there were metal detectors at the stadium. There were metal detectors uh, at, at the airports. Um, uh, it, it was a whole different world. Uh, the world changed. Uh, it changed for the better for a while because everyone was together. Boy, was that a unified effort! Um, uh, it, it was really fun. I I worked uh, a lot of the recovery uh, and. and um, there wasn't really recovery, um, uh, but but because we never we never recovered any uh, anyone from from the rubble. Um, but uh, you know, everyone was together for sure. Bobby, what did you guys do? You you mentioned you worked uh, on the recovery, you worked on the cleanup. Um, what did players do? What, what what did you do during those ten days? I did as much as I could. Uh, to reach out to people, you know, at the first few days, uh, you know, Shea Stadium was uh, was the staging area for for all the supplies that went down to Ground Zero. So we had uh, we had a makeshift uh, Home Depot, if you would, built in our parking lot uh, with people from all around the area, from businesses and and homes and. And factories bringing things, boxes that we would uncrate of of blue jeans and socks and masks and eye drop and yeah, I mean you name it. You can imagine the things that that were brought because there were thousands of people working twenty four seven in in a, a un, unthinkable um, arena of of tragedy, and um, you know we were there to supply them with. Uh, new T-shirts uh, when they when they came out, they're filthy, dirty, uh, uh, and smelly, and and um, tired, and uh, you know, you know, we, we were there to just do that. And then once the once that situation um, became futile, and uh, we realized, and everyone realized that it was too late to ever hope uh, that anyone would get out of there alive. Um, you know, then it became a healing process. Then it became, uh, you know, first going to funerals, then going to homes, then going to uh, schools, and then to uh, where, wherever uh, the the players' presence could be um, could do a little good. And it, it was a big it was a big wound. So there was only uh, little things we were doing, but we were doing it uh, one little step at a time. Bobby, I got to ask you, I got thrown out twice of a college basketball game when I was coaching at Bowling Green. I got thrown out at Virginia Tech. And naughty, I didn't go naughty, disguise, naughty, naughty. Bad guy. And then I just went and sat in the stands up high. There weren't a lot of people in the gym. I went and sat in the stands. The referee saw me and he threw me out again. I wasn't as clever as you, Bobby. I didn't get the mustache. I didn't put on the glasses. What made you do that? That is an iconic moment. What made you do that? Well, the team needed a little levity, actually. Um, we, were, we, were, we were going through some tough times. You know, a team lost seven in a row, and uh, a lot of my coaches were fired, and uh, – uh, you know, everyone had that kind of uh, deer in the headlights look, and and uh, they needed a little levity in the tenth tenth inning after uh, we blew a lead, and then the, the game was tied, and it looked like we were going to give one away. And, um, and I came back, and even the great John Olerud smiled, who was as stoic a player <laughs> as uh, uh, I think I ever had. Uh, but when he saw it, he smiled, and we won, and. Uh, all ends uh, all, all well that ends well because we went on to um, make the playoffs that year. <laughs> did you seriously? Did you seriously have to fight or potentially fight Ricky Henderson and Bobby Bonilla on a flight? No. Oh, good, good. No. I'd read that somewhere that that Bonilla and Henderson wanted a piece of you and. Man, you know, you, or, you know, and, and can't uh, believe everything no, you're eating. Yeah. No, I Bobby know. Bobby and I, I, I almost got into it in 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 the dugout one time, but never on a flight. And Ricky was Ricky was cool. I think someone made that nonsense up because uh, you know the last day of the '99 series, Game Six of the um, League Championship Series, um, 
they weren't on the bench. You know, they they were finishing a card game that they had been playing all year long, and uh, they were in the clubhouse, and uh, you know, everyone thought that that was a big deal. So someone made up that we almost fought on a plane. Probably, I mean, that's where you heard that nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I do, I do want to go back to the uh, you know the glasses and how what 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 did you get oh, fined for that? Come on, come on, they, come on, come on! There's got to be something more than glass. I I managed uh, four thousand games. You're talking about thirty seconds of I, my life. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I know, but this is the most fa- <laughs> this is the most fascinating to me. I'm not going to lie, because and I coached for twenty five years, and when I saw That's that, good. I thought to myself, you know what? That's pretty damn good. That's that's actually really. Why don't more coaches do? That? I did. I, I well, admired maybe they it, did. Maybe I'm they had better you disguises. You know, I mean, Ooh. Uh, you know, very. Yeah, I, I've yeah. heard I've heard things of managers thinking about coming back in the mascots uh, uniform. Uh, you know, I, I I I I don't know. It was one of those things. They really needed me on the bench. I felt and. Um, my guys, uh, Robin Ventura and, and uh, Oral Hershiser, both contributed. They uh, they gave me the glasses and the hat, and uh, you know the mustache is mine. I found the stuff that you put underneath your eye. You know when uh, yeah when you you worry about the sun and that that mustache is all that is is two little stickers, uh, one going one way and one going the other way. It actually worked out pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> I think it hey, worked the, out great. You took me hat, off. This is, you, this is my buddy's championship hat. It looks similar with the circle thing there. That's uh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I got to ask you, you off air, yeah. you told me uh, what your stepson or your son in law is the general manager of the Angels. You coach, as you mentioned, a thousand years. You're involved in baseball a thousand years. I got to ask you about Mike Trout. It is, is, and this isn't necessarily about Trout. This is about players in general. What is it? Is it about how they play? Is it about how their body is? What is it about, in your experience across baseball, what, what is it about players that makes them more or less injury prone? And how much of that is just Ooh. dumb luck? Wow, Coach. If I if I knew the answer to that, you know, we could bottle that <laughs> up and sell it out on the, on the street corner and make a lot of money. Um you know, it's my best friend's son who's the general manager of the Angels. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, Mike Trout getting hurt for the last few years has been uh, unpredictably uh, sickening. Uh, you know, one of the greatest players, if not the greatest player ever, and and playing a full season. Uh, if you add up all three of the last seasons, uh, you, know, it, you know, and it's been this and it's been that. Uh, he's wound tight. He's a real strong guy. Um, some of the situations with muscles, I could understand. But, you know, this year, he missed the whole season. First, he had a, a meniscus uh, tear. And many people think, you know, after a month, you come back and you play. And it took him a f- three months to come back. And then when he was getting ready to play, uh, he tore it again. So um, you go figure, right? Some guys play every day. Uh, of of every game and um, or, or every even inning of every every game, and play for five years. And Cal Ripken never got hurt. And and uh, other guys go out there and and before you know it, they're on the injured list and and they're truly missed because it's hard. You you don't just replace a Mike Trout. I guarantee you that. You know, a friend of mine I grew up with, Danny Plezak, played 19 years, I think it was, in the big leagues, never spent one day on the disabled list. Now, he's a reliever. I get it. It's different. Don't get me wrong. I, I understand it. But it's just I had basketball players like that. Guy would be hurt. He'd come back. He'd get hurt again. And you're like, damn, how can I help you? You know what I mean? Like, I want to help you. But Yeah, Coach. You know, you know, I'm sure you've had them. And it's not like a body type. It's not a mental thing. It's it's more luck than anything and, and bad luck at that. Um, being with the Angels, you got to see Otani. And is it a function of modern economics that Otani couldn't stay uh, with the Angels, is it just maybe this has been the way it's always been? Ricky Henderson, we mentioned earlier, he jumped around. Guys have always jumped around. Two questions. Is it modern economics that Otani couldn't stay? Number two, how good is Otani in your, your view, historically? Yeah, Otani's uh, 
the best player to put on a uniform as far as I'm concerned. The only thing I saw close, and I didn't see Mike Trout at his best uh, up close and personal, but, you know, got to manage against ba Barry Bonds uh, for quite a few years. And, and Barry was uh, different. Uh, Otani's different. Uh, he, he's really special. When he's pitching and hitting, he's uh, like no one that ever even tried to do it in in our in our lifetime, as we know. Uh, but you know, he's bigger and faster, and he throws it harder when he's healthy and hits it further, and and has a great acumen for the game and and a, a great desire. He's he's one of those guys. Uh, you know, your sports had a few of them. They're geniuses. They're they're different. They're different than everybody else. You know, everybody else is really good. You know, everybody else are those concert pianists uh, that are all gathered together at uh, Count Carnegie Hall. But but he's Mozart. You know, he's he's composing it and uh, he, he, he's different. Is it is it modern economics that he couldn't stay or is this been going on? I don't know about, about modern years years economics. Um you know, you'd have to ask the uh, you'd have to ask the owner. Uh, I thought he was staying. I thought there was going to be a match. Uh, we didn't particularly like deferrals, I guess. Um, you know, and you know, old economics or modern economics. Seven hundred million is a scary number, uh, but he's worth every cent of it. What's the most you ever made as a manager, if I might ask? <laughs> oh, I made four or five million. Uh, you know, a few years in Japan, it made a few million. Did you really? Here. Yeah, sure. Did you really? You made four or five million managing in the, in Japan. Sure. Yeah, I was there for wow. six years. You what? know, I was the first first ever foreign manager, non Japanese manager, to manage in Japan, and uh, I guess winning the championship was pretty good. So, uh, and now I have three of my players, uh, ex players, uh, all are managing in that league. And um, it looks like they're they're all kind of battling for two two uh, playoff spots. I'm really excited for them. What was the biggest? I know the language and that kind of stuff, but on the field, what was the biggest adjustment managing you know Major League Baseball or managing in Japan? Well, it wasn't much different on the field. Um, you know, it's the same game, and and uh, yeah. You know, you you'll get a kick out of this. When when I first got hired, the general manager that hired me was a spectacular baseball person, um, and uh, he says, "You know, you're going to have a big press conference, and they're going to ask you questions." So, do me a favor, and I said, "Yeah, what's that?" He said, "Don't do what all those American managers do in a press conference." And uh, I said, "What is it that all American managers do?" Oh, you know, they say uh, I only have two rules. Uh, Show up on time and hustle. And I said, well, uh, what, what's wrong with that? Uh, what's wrong with saying something like that? And he said, listen, we always show up on time and we always hustle. So they might laugh if you say <laughs> something like that. I thought that was kind of cool. So, so I didn't use that in my yeah, so what, press conference. So what'd you, what'd you say? Oh, I talked about preparation and I talk about, I talked about, uh, you know, teamwork, which is another one of those things, you know, they really, they get the teamwork from the time they're, they're young, you know, the, the kids go to, the kids go to elementary school and from the time they get to kindergarten until like fifth and sixth grade, they, there's no janitors in the schools. The kids clean up their own classrooms. The kids clean their own hallways. The kids clean their own cafeterias. Think about that for a second of learning how to work as a team. <laughs> you know, when I, when I was a kid, when I was 12, 13 years old, they used to have the, you know, the Little League World Series. The next level is 13 to 15. The Senior League World Series was oh, in sure. my hometown of Gary, yeah. Indiana. Yeah, it, it, it was in my hometown of Gary, Indiana. And I watched – Dwight Gooden and Gary Sheffield and Vance Lovelace and all these guys. But the Japanese team, the Taiwanese team came over and just like the little league at the time, they always won. And we used to go watch them practice and everything was incredibly disciplined, Bobby. Like everything was boom, boom, boom. Is that the way the professional league was there? Yeah. In, 
in Japan. Um, yeah, you know, they showed up on time and, and, and discipline was part of it, uh, obviously. You know, think about this for a second, Coach. The dugouts were clean because they didn't take their cups <laughs> of water and throw it on the on the floor like we do here. <laughs> you know, there was no one chewing tobacco and spitting it on the floor in a dugout. It was a workplace. It was a place that that you that was sacred, you know. You, they didn't chew gum and throw it on the field. Are you kidding me? Discipline isn't such a bad thing, you know. No, oh, I think it's a great thing. I mean, I love I, that's the hallmark <laughs> of my life. What's wor- what's worse in a major league dugout? Gum on the ground, chewing tobacco on the ground, or seeds on the ground? <laughs> I'll tell you, it's a man. I remember some some dugouts at the end of the game where it, it was hard to walk through it. You know, there's so much garbage <laughs> right. on the on the floor that uh uh it's really different. You know, I, I I guess I didn't notice it until I came back. And when I came back, I went, What the hell is this? And the garbage can's right there. You know, the, the, the crazy thing in Japan, you know, invariably when I had people come over to visit me, within the first couple of days, they would say, hey, Bobby, why don't aren't there any litter cans uh, on the streets? And after a while, I set it up with one of my Japanese players to answer it for the guys because they don't have litter cans on the street. And so one of my Japanese guys would come over and I had my friend ask him, Hey, why aren't there any litter cans on the street? And it was all set up to give the answer. And he would give the answer in his broken English and say, because there's no litter. And they'd say, (laughs) but why is there no litter? And they would say, because there's no litter cans, you know? And that, (laughs) That kind of circular just kept going. there too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It just, there was no way out of that either way, right? It was just That's like this. Is, we're going. We can do this. We can do this all day, right? That's hey, uh, last thing. You ever? You ever? Uh, I know you've been in different roles uh, in your life. I know you're an athletic director. All, all kind of. You ever? You ever think about running for public office? Wow, you know, I did that. I don't know why it's not on my resume. Oh, that's right. Matter, matter back right. about four years four years ago, I guess. Uh, my hometown of Stanford, Connecticut, uh, looked like it had an opening, and as an unaffiliated candidate, I built my entire um, campaign from scratch, raised a million bucks. You know, it's one hundred fifty thousand people. It's not a small city. Did the, did the whole thing for seven months and lost by a few thousand votes and. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I got in a car, went to California, and hooked up with uh, Perry <laughs> Manassian. And I've been been out here for for three years now, enjoying life. <laughs> Samford, hey, Samford, Connecticut, must be a hell of a place because I was NBC's there, right? Isn't NBC Sports yeah. there? And, 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 I mean, NBC, right? WWE's there. Yeah, there's uh, Samford's yeah. a cool place. It's probably a lot of people thinking I'm part of my campaign pitch and I grew up there and it's my hometown. I'll be back there. Uh, you know, it's one of those good little cities between New York and Boston. Uh, basically, one of the good little cities between Philadelphia and Boston if you take the, the New York cities out of there. Yeah. <laughs> 